Hello and welcome to an Infinity the Game Faction Focus for the Aleph Operations Subsection Sectoral. In this video, we're talking about who OSS are, how they play, what are their strengths, weaknesses, and faction identity, before jumping into Infinity Army to go over many of the profiles that you will use if you play OSS, and which kind of showcase how the faction plays. As always, big thanks to channel supporters who make videos like this possible, including in this case channel supporter Spooky Noises, who made the request for an OSS video. If you'd like to support the channel, you can do so via the Buy Me A Coffee link in the video description below, or by becoming a channel member on YouTube. So, who are OSS as a faction? I would describe them as one of the game's highest technology factions. And that's not just narratively, although narratively they are extremely high technology, not just aesthetically, but aesthetically they are extremely high technology, but also mechanically, how they play in-game. They make a lot of use of many of Infinity's more interlocking and complicated mechanics, or mechanics which evoke that kind of high technology theme. So in that vein, and by the way, big thanks to channel friend of the channel, Zephyr, who I reached out to to discuss this OSS faction focus. I've actually played against OSS a lot with it a little bit, but it is always very useful to get multiple perspectives for a video like this, and Zephyr was kind enough to send through a bunch. Um, the first part of their high technology vibe really does begin with hacking and kind of lead in then through their lieutenant choices. At obviously, Operations Subsection have some very, very powerful info war options. They don't conduct info war in quite the same way, for example, as Nomads, but there are some similarities. And especially for Operations Subsection, the high watermark of hacking that you have access to is some of the highest in the game. And the overall hacking presence that you can put in a list is frequently some of the highest in the game. Nomads, by comparison, will often have a list that makes very good use of a little bit of hacking, because hacking is part of the Nomad identity, but in Operation Subsections lists, very frequently, at least one of your two lists in a two-list pairing, will have some really significant hacking chops, often two or even three willpower 15 hackers with some resilience and good stats and good network projection, just as part of how you would broadly build your list. This obviously makes guided missile plays very, very strong and very easy in OSS, but in addition to that, they can be a good utility hacking faction. They make exceptional use of support wear. Possibly some of the best, probably, no, definitely one of the two best factions for making use of support wear in the entire game, period. And they're also very good at establishing hacking dominance over lists like, for example, Nomads, who might bring just enough hacking to be a nuisance and or be useful in many sort of game circumstances. Aleph can muscle in on the hacking style of game, and Operations Subsection have some lieutenant choices that are truly exceptional in that space. Lieutenant choice singular. In that vein, another really notable strength of OSS is they have some absolutely banging lieutenants. Now, this is not the same as like how Yu Ching often have command and control as a theme, where Yu Ching make really good use of the existence of their lieutenant as part of a broader strategy, with things like NCO, for example. Operations subsection has very, very good lieutenants that themselves contribute significantly to your battle plan. We are going to talk at length about the Asura, for example, but there are multiple other choices, the Shukra, the Marut, that are high impact lieutenants, which can be really fun to play with and really, really strong. Continuing the technology theme, We've got some very, very good remotes, which, as I mentioned, make excellent use of force multiplication through things like Evo hackers and supportware, but also link team bonuses. And those remotes then lean into what I would call the final really notable strength of OSS, which is incredible force reconstitution. Because you are running so many remotes, your army is very, very repairable, and because your army is very repairable, you kind of have this built-in crumple zone where, yes, you might sustain casualties, but recovering those casualties, provided you keep a few key pieces alive, is very, very doable. Now, all of those strengths obviously do come with some limitations, which is why OSS isn't just an auto-win button, despite the really, really good things that I have mentioned, and they start with being a very, very hackable faction. OSS is good at establishing hacking dominance, but if it doesn't, for whatever reason, if it can't, you know, ferret out all of your opponent's hackers and take them out, eliminate them, counter-hack them, whatever, 
there are perishingly few pieces in OSS that can advance safely through an enemy hacking network or which just aren't vulnerable to enemy offensive hacking operations. You have hackers and remotes as most of your force in any given case, which makes enemy hacking very, very frustrating. Historically, this has also made close assault for Operation Subsection quite difficult as well. They can be very good at establishing firepower superiority, but not necessarily good at then really pushing forward aggressively and capitalizing on that if your opponent's hacking network is still intact. And that to an extent is still true. There have been some pieces added to OSS that have given them not just solid close assault, but actually really quite high quality, but those pieces remain hackable. And so OSS really needs to continue to fight this combined arms, broad spectrum sort of warfare where it shoots very well and it hacks very well. And it needs to do not just one of those, but often both in order to then successfully launch close assaults. And for this reason, it's often very important as OSS to really build not just one, but two lists going into an event that make different use of different levels of these strengths, because your opponents are not always going to bring the same challenges and solutions in their lists, which means that OSS needs to have a degree of flexibility when preparing two lists. The very obvious and very classic example is you could be playing against Nomads, or you could be playing against Ariadna or Toha. And Ariadna or Toha are not going to frustrate you with their own hacking networks that prevent your hackable pieces from you know, making advances up the table. But on the other hand, all of the countermeasures that you bought to deal with enemy hacking networks, any like killer hackers or trinity that you have in the list, are just not going to be pulling much duty. And so your plan for unpicking your opponent's defensive measures against your kind of list might just end up being ill-suited to the defensive measures they actually have if you assume that one size fits all for operation subsection. Finally, and on a simpler kind of mechanical level, it's not uncommon for OSS to be vulnerable to enemy close assault and template kind of attacks, because there is only going to be so much MSV available to an operation subsection list. There are a couple of pieces that have MSV2 or even MSV3, and they can be quite high quality, but MSV2 ARO pieces are going to be a little bit rare. And a lot of pieces in your list aren't going to have particularly high armor. There will be remote presence everywhere, which means that a chain rifle's likelihood of actually killing anything is going to be virtually negligible in many cases. And even flamethrowers will struggle to do enough damage through remote presence to actually kill models. But you need to have a certain mindset going into that kind of engagement where, yes, you might sustain casualties, but as long as you can reconstitute them, that's okay. It doesn't always feel all right to take a bunch of wounds and have a bunch of models go down and have to recover them, right? The emotional blow of sustaining two or three or four casualties on your first defensive turn can be high, even if you you finish your first active turn with all 15 troopers back and operational in the list. So maintaining that kind of like, no, actually, these casualties are fine. These are disposable remotes, and I'll have them back on their feet soon. Attitude can be very important to successfully defending with Operation Subsection, because if you're not willing to use those pieces as your crumple zone, your list can become quite vulnerable to close assault that goes after the pieces that you can't reconstitute or replace. So overall, this makes Operation Subsection a very cool high technology faction. They have lots of interlocking pieces. They make very good use of link teams, large and small. They make fantastic use of remotes. They are good at gunfighting. They have high willpower specialists. They don't have any smoke. So we are talking about a Pan-Oceanian style faction where you have to actually shoot your way forward if there are aero pieces engaging you with some very limited exceptions for use of marker state. But they will generally have access to healthy order counts, healthy trooper counts, and some very, very powerful options across basically all of the offensive and defensive spectrums in Infinity if you go looking for them. They are a very solid, very powerful faction and will probably remain so in N5, although we will, as we go through the units in Army, talk a little bit about how some of them might change, might change and how we might kind of hope that the sectoral changes or translates to N5 to the best of our ability. 
Now, in terms of structuring this section, I actually struggled a little bit to decide where to begin, because to me, there are several places that we might want to focus on as the real core or beginning of an OSS list, and the link teams are really just part of that. For most other sectoral armies, I would usually start with the you know, most significant linkable troopers, but there are things that compete with the humble Dakini Tackbot in this case for pride of place in an OSS list. Nevertheless, we are starting with Dakinis. Now, in many respects, the operations subsection and the combined army Onyx contact force really are dark mirrors to each other, in that the really the core fire team is a combat remote fire team, where the Onyx contact force has the dogged plasma wielding Unidron Batroids, the operations subsection has the Dakini tack bots. Unidron Batroids are very good, Dakini tack bots are exceptional. Although they clock in at a minimum of 13 points each, you get a lot for those 13 points. And really the only significant downside of Dakinis is that in some cases you will be using them so much that it can make certain missions that don't favor remotes very slightly frustrating. Something like evacuation, for example, which requires a lot of civilian evacuation, can be a little frustrating if you don't include enough living units to be able to do those parts of the mission, but worry not, there are plenty of living units in OSS. Dakini Tackbots are your fire team troopers. Uh, you can run an unlimited number of duos, but more importantly, one Harris and one Core. And although there are many options for each of those in Operation Subsection, I'm not going to beat around the bush. 98% of all of your fire teams, Harris or Core, will be Dakini fire teams. They are generally just going to be the most useful, the most powerful, the most flexible. They're very, very good. So what do we what do we get for our 13 plus points in a Dakini? Well. Armor 0 and BTS 3, which means we are dealing with kind of fragile models, low fizz, only ballistic skill 11, but because they are a remote, they can be subject to the marksmanship support wear, and they have 6-4 movement and mimetism, and remote presence, which means that they are actually very good gunfighters, because with marksmanship, one of these is effectively ballistic skill 14 with mimetism, and with full core link bonuses, that effectively makes them 17 with mimetism, which is some of the highest watermark shooting just kind of in the game. Obviously, it takes a bit of work to get there. You don't just sort of start the game with your support wear up for free. But once you get your force multiplication online, this is a very, very powerful and efficient link team. Because you'll often be using Dakini tack bots as some of your ARO pieces, you can also use total reaction bots, for example. But Dakini multi-sniper rifles, for example, are a common ARO piece in OSS, we're making not just good use of all of those force multipliers and that mimetism, but also very good use of remote presence, where we basically force our opponent to assume risk, potentially take damage in ARO, but ultimately commit a bunch of orders to putting that Dakini down so they can advance, only for us to bring it back with an engineer on our very next turn. Now, although there is a specialist profile, the paramedic Dakini, that is going to be a bit more of a sometimes pick because we will usually be looking elsewhere for our specialists in our Dakini links. There are a couple of other choices. CSUs and Denavis are the most common ones that we will generally be leaning towards particularly on our forward-moving Harris teams, where breaking the composition bonus of the Dakini isn't that important. We might take a single paramedic in the Dakini Tackbot pure core link, mostly because we are trying to keep that link team pure. Otherwise, easily the most common profiles are the combi rifle as link filler, the heavy machine gun for active high burst firepower, and the multi-sniper rifle either for ARO or anti-armor duties. Now, looking forward to the future edition and N5, it is not particularly likely that anything about Dakini Tackbots will really materially change. Nothing that we've seen about the new edition at this stage suggests significant changes for them, and they're probably considered to be working pretty well. But one of the things that Zephyr mentioned when I consulted with them about their hopes for the faction in the new edition is really just that something that would be nice and something to keep an eye out for when we're assessing OSS in N5 is that the Dakinis just get some competition. One of the most significant genuine limitations of the faction really is that the only fire teams that are worth taking, Harris or Core, are Dakini fire teams. And particularly those Harris teams can be very, very flexible. I have run OSS lists, for example, that run a three-person Core or three-person Harris, because of course I have. 
Toha and their three-person teams have corrupted me, absolutely. But most of your lists with OSS, no matter what you're doing and what scenario you're trying to play, are going to start with a five-person Dakini team and potentially also include a three-person Dakini team. That consumes quite a lot of space, even though the flexes we will make, and even the flexes we will make within those teams can be pretty significant. There are actually possibilities now, at least in late N4, to vary up the Dakini core team a little bit, thanks to some additional remotes that have been added to the faction, we are still in a position where there's some pretty significant core similarity across a lot of our list, which is an advantage if you are practicing for an event and learning the faction, but limits the depth of the faction just a little bit. OSS is by no means a mono build faction, but if you're interested in them in an N4 position, you better buy a bunch of Takinis because you're going to need them. They are awesome. They're really awesome. They're one of the best links in the game, just hands down. Uh, but they're very hard to stray away from. Now, generally at this point, having spoken about the building blocks of the link teams in the sectoral, I would then move on to how we can expand those link teams. But in this case, I want to divert very slightly through a couple of profiles. We'll talk about the lieutenants in a moment because I think they're very important to how OSS functions. But we've got to stop and talk now about posthumans. If you are playing posthumans, let me make no bones about this. If you're paying, playing OSS, posthumans are an auto include. There's a bit of flexibility in how you take them, but they are a selling point of the faction. Not only are they narratively and thematically incredibly cool, they are also point for point just one of the most powerful things in the game. Like, hands down, no contest. They were nerfed from N3 to N4, and they are still one of the most powerful choices in the game period. How posthumans work is that you are taking one trooper, but that one trooper has three or two or three bodies. You might take three. A lot of the time you will find yourself actually taking just two, even though the value proposition is very good for any individual posthuman body. And that's just because OSS are an SWC hungry faction, and by the time you get to the third posthuman body, you start having to spend SWC in ways that maybe you don't want to. That is the typical constraining factor. So, how the posthuman works is that you will take two or three proxies. No two proxies can be from the same mark of proxy. So, on screen there, we can see proxy mark one and proxy mark two, but there are others as well, which I'll scroll down as we go over the course of this. And those two or three bodies just occupy one troop slot. Uh, there are some very gentle limitations on how they can function. Uh, no two posthuman proxies can take an ARO against the same enemy trooper, but that's basically it. Between, as long as one of the proxies is still on the table, the posthuman generates its regular order. So you don't get from three posthuman proxies three orders, you just get one, but that one order persists until all of the proxies are dead. The only kind of vulnerability that comes with Ghost Jumper is that isolation effectively is, is a null state for proxies. It renders them effectively inert as it kicks the posthuman, the digital consciousness, out of them and into the, one of their other proxies. This can mean that things like Toha Eraser Ferroware or Electromagnetic Ammunition is a bit more of a vulnerability for pieces like this. And if you are playing a hackable proxy, then the Oblivion isolating program is actually nominally a lethal attack against that kind of proxy because it puts them into a null state. Now, despite all that, posthumans are still obviously very good, not just because being able to circumvent the usual 15 trooper limit is powerful, but because every single proxy, even the weakest like point-for-point -point proxy, is still incredible value. How Corvus Belli does their design, at least as a starting point, is that they have like a formula-based design where everything that the trooper has, it contributes toward an overall points value, and that points value is calculated by formula. Some things make a model more expensive, some things make a model cheaper, etc. We don't have a full picture of how the formula works, but we do know from posthumans that the idea that a trooper might generate half or a third of a regular order is a significant discount because on their own merits, these profiles for their points cost are cracked. Just from the two that we have on screen, either one of these, if it didn't generate an order, 
at all will still be insane value. And it's the proxy mark one and the proxy mark two that will usually be your two kind of auto pick proxies. And then we will choose from the rest. We'll go through those in time. So the proxy mark one, you are most commonly going to be taking that 13 point engineer. Well, what do you get for your 13 points? Well, to start with, it's willpower 15 which makes it, to my knowledge, the highest willpower engineer in the game and makes getting your Dakinis back up just kind of trivial. 13 points plus 3 points for a Yardbot gives you all of the force reconstitution you might need for the entire game, provided you keep that proxy itself safe. And that proxy usually hangs out in the middle of your Dakini link team while the Yardbot runs around doing other things if needed. Oh, well, okay, but it's vulnerable, right? The proxy, the proxy engineer, it's just an engineer. No, you fool, you rube. It's ballistic skill 13, armor 2, BTS 3, no wound incapacitation, mimetism. It is by itself one of the better gunfighters in the game as well, and is highly durable. Unless you have some means of inflicting isolation on a proxy, actually going after them and killing them is really, really difficult, because they are very, very tough. You could pay 13 points just for that as a gunfighter, and it would be like obscene value. 13 points for a no wound cap armor 2, BTS 3, BS 13 mimetism model, even with a combi rifle and a nanopulsor, is like, what? That's insane. That's insane. And it's a whip 15 engineer. Uh, yes, there are some other profiles. There's a Doctor Mark 1 and a Hacker Mark 1. The Hacker Mark 1, under any other circumstance, would be another, like, auto pick in literally any faction that could take it, but we can only have one proxy mark one, and the rest of the list, particularly given how important Dakinis are, cries out for that engineer. There are some other engineers in operations subsection, but the proxy mark one engineer is just so effective for cost, and the other engineers in the faction are expensive enough that we basically lock ourselves into the proxy mark one engineer. In many cases, it's the first model that you'll add to a list. Now, we have to add one or two more proxies in order to make the proxies legal as a choice. You can't take just one proxy, but that's fine. We wouldn't take just one proxy anyway. The second proxy we take will usually be one of the two proxy Mark IIs with a significant bias toward the hacker. Now, the proxy Mark II is an infiltrating mimetism minus six, surprise attack, no win incapacitation, ballistic skill 13, infiltrator, which is, wow, that's exceptional. Surely pieces like that, like the, the Desus, right? The Desus exists in Operation Subsection. There's a multi-sniper, Proxy Mark 1. Let's compare it to the Desus. Now, the Desus is on screen there now. It is, it is ultimately, it is expensive, right? The Desus is an expensive piece because having Mimetism 6 and no wound incapacitation, etc., that ultimately adds up. There are also some skills that will make a Desus them further, like, more expensive. The Desu has hidden deployment, which the post-human doesn't, and that is significant. The Desu also has NCO, and I have no idea when the Desu got uh, Desu got NCO. I actually have no memory of them ever having NCO, but they have that, apparently. It's not a skill that you will almost ever use, ever, in Operation Subsection, because our lieutenants will often either be strategios or spend their orders themselves, or both. But these are things that bloat the cost of the Desu. Okay, with that in mind, how much is a multi-sniper Desu? It's 39 points. Now, we can knock off four points for NCO. That puts it at about 35. Hidden deployment costs a little bit. But broadly, we can see from the Desu that we would expect a ballistic skill 12, no wound incapacitation, infiltrating mimetism, multi-sniper to be, you know, in the vicinity of like maybe 34, 35 points. How much, therefore, is the post-human, which is identical and higher ballistic skill? It's 28. It's 28 points. It's what? Like, these costs are ridiculous. Now, the reason why we are actually not going to take the multi-sniper proxy mark to too often is that, as I mentioned, Operation Subsection is a faction that really jealously hoards its SWC. We are often going to be running guided missiles, we're often going to be running multiple hackers, we're often going to be running an Evo hacker to support our remotes, and we're often going to be running combat remotes with SWC costs. This means that it's just going to be a little bit difficult much of the time to find yet more SWC for the Proxy Mark II sniper, as exceptional as it is. 
and this means we must instead console ourselves with a willpower 15, no wound incapacitation, mimetism 6, camouflage, ballistic skill 13, boarding shotgun hacker for a mere 25 points. Now, I'm not going to jump back to the Daisu and make the same comparison that I did, just take my word for it that that points cost is completely cracked. Once you add the cost of the Proxy Mark II and the Proxy Mark I Engineer together, you start getting something that would approach the cost of either one of these in isolation if they were a normal troop, which means they are just they are free money in so many respects. Take these pieces. Now, once we've taken our Mark I and our Mark II, which are going to be in most of our lists, even lists that have exclusion zones, we can optionally take a third posthuman. It is strictly optional. You need two or three. And the value begins to peter off a little bit on the other profiles we have access to. Now, on screen now, we have the proxy Mark III and Mark IV. We'll get to the Mark V in a second. Mark III and Mark IV are going to be our less commonly taken, although you can by all means take either of these. The Mark III is a heavy infantry AP Spitfire. Armor-piercing Spitfire is exceptional, but on a heavy infantry, even a 6-2 move one, Ballistic Skill 13 is a little bit on the low side and would kind of be a no-sell if it wasn't for, again, 23 points. You're absolutely kidding me. Now, the Proxy Mark III being heavy infantry is therefore subject to the Oblivion hacking program, which is a kill, effectively, against these kind of proxies, because isolation is a null state for them. Yes, you will have an engineer, but it isn't really something that you want to be doing, and we are, again, SWC hungry. So, as much as I personally really like the Proxy Mark III, it's going to be a difficult fit in many lists, and the same is kind of true for the Proxy Mark IV. Similar, Lots of heavy, like much heavier in this case, but slower. It isn't 6-2 movement, the Mark IV, but it is Armor 5 BTS 6. And here we have a heavy machine gun and a HRL profile. Now, special shout out actually to the HRL profile, which you will see from time to time. More so in vanilla Aleph, which isn't bearing all of the support load of the Dakini package that OSS is. But the Proxy Mark IV heavy rocket launcher as a purely disposable ARO piece actually is an absolute tick to deal with. Armor 5, BTS 6, Courage, Ballistic Skill 13, Heavy Rocket Launcher, for a revoltingly cheap 21 points, can literally be just put up on ARO duty somewhere with the intention of buying you a first turn. If you've got something like Pan... Uh, Parvati, for example, you might even have a very, very good doctor for recovering it, but we start to get a little bit expensive at that point. In OSS, the SWC cost makes it difficult to afford, but if you are looking for a gun proxy to take alongside your utility proxies, this is a fun one that the heavy rocket launcher is a very fun one to use if you've got the points for it. Now, most common as our third proxy, if we take one, is the proxy Mark V, because it is relatively low SWC. They do cost minimum a half an SWC, which can be a little bit tricky to find. But a half an SWC is at least something that you can find in most OSS lists, whereas the full one and a half SWC for a post human can be a bit tricky. Now, both of these, for my mind, are very good profiles. We've got a bit more armor, but no mimetism on this one. Armor 3, BTS 3, no wound incapacitation. Forward deployment is quite nice. Ballistic skill 13, standard on proxies, is very good. You will usually find yourself taking the submachine gun profile. The Mark 12 is a very good gun, but the submachine gun profile is a willpower 15 forward observer. Plus one burst submachine gun is very dangerous, particularly if it goes into suppressive fire or gets into a good range. And those EM grenades, for all that they are a low fizz, fizz 11, can sometimes be very useful. Finally, it's just cheaper. It's 13 points. If you do nothing with this model other than just throw it into suppressive fire early in the game with a single order and leave it there being very annoying for the entire game, it can still be very useful in that capacity. Literally the only roadblock to taking the Proxy Mark V in every single list forever is that it costs a half SWC, which was a change that was made between N3 and N4 to help balance out post-humans a little bit. In OSS especially, it can be genuinely difficult to find that half an SWC. Every SWC is precious, and so the Proxy Mark V SMG is a piece that you will often add into lists, but then sometimes have find yourself tragically having to cut just to be able to afford everything else that it is that you want. Overall, though, post-humans are very possibly the best units for cost in the entire game, and they were one of the things that I'm like, should I just should I just have this entire rant before we even get to the Dakinis? But I decided the Dakinis were ultimately important enough to mention first. Nevertheless, post-humans are a major selling point for Operation Subsection. They, alongside Vanilla Aleph, are the only two factions in the entire game that have access to the Ghost Jumper special rule. They are truly exceptional and an absolute joy to play.
Now, next up, before we finally circle back around to the things that can be used to supplement our Dakini links, I want to just pause again and talk about some of the really, really cool lieutenant profiles that Operations Subsection has access to. And we're going to start with what I think is one of the selling points of the Sectoral, which is the Asurus. Now, there are a lot of profiles there. We are not really going to care about any of them other than one, and it is the one that is unique to OSS. Asuras generally are very solid profiles, but also very expensive. Uh, no matter what Asura profile you are taking, there is a chance that, with the exception of the unique one in OSS, you are wasting some part of the profile. For example, the 63-point Spitfire makes excellent use of the multispectral visor, but it's still just a Spitfire profile, and we're paying for, among other things, Willpower 15. The Asura that, to my mind, is absolutely the strongest and most useful is the 65 point, sorry, 69 point, uh, very bottom there, the Lieutenant, plus one order, hacker, hacking device plus with Trinity plus two damage. 69 nice points makes it the most expensive Asura, and that is expensive, but it is zero SWC, which makes a very big difference in OSS. And in addition to being an eminently capable gunfighter, only armed with a multi-rifle, but there are things you can do with an MSV-3 that you just can't do with any other piece. Never having to roll dice to discover is a really big deal. It is tough, it is durable, right? Armor 5, BTS-6, two wounds, no wound incapacitation is super heavy infantry level durability. Its ballistic skill is certainly good enough to take fights. It is fast at 6-2 movement, and because it is a hacker, 6-2 movement really lets you motor up the field while you are making hacking attacks. And then finally, of course, it is one of the absolute apex hackers in the entire game. In fact, pound for pound, there is very, very little that comes even close to equaling an Asura. It can fight an anathematic on about equal grounds. The anathematic is maybe slightly better as a predator piece because of, you know, a few different things. But the Asura is a hacking device plus, and Trinity plus two damage opens up certain target selections that the Anathematic struggles with. If you are trying to stage dive an enemy repeater network to kill an Interventor, the Anathematic can really struggle to punch through that BTS 9 plus the firewall penalty, whereas the Asura will have a much less difficult time. And that is where she really comes into her own. Yes, she is 69 nice points, but you get all of the hacking you might possibly need for zero SWC. Now, there are a few ways that we can support her if we take her as our lieutenant. And one of those is we will probably be taking an Evo hacker in OSS anyway. We'll talk about them in a tick. But bear in mind that she is heavy infantry. And because she's heavy infantry, you can use the fairy dust support wear to give her a firewall, which means that you have the option of walking into enemy repeater networks and fighting their hackers and you will have firewall bonuses of your own to equalize that fight. If you are playing against like a Nomad list, for example, that has just, you know, Jazz, for example, as a hacker, it's very common to see that kind of Nomad list that skimps out quite a lot. Jazz and yeah, maybe one other hacker, you can just fairy dust the Asura and walk into range of a Moran and just kill every hacker in the Nomad list trivially and establish immediate and irrevocable hacking supremacy because Trinity with plus two damage is comfortably powerful enough to start bashing through BTS six hackers even with firewall bonuses. On top of that, her active and, and aero hacking because she's willpower 15 is very, very reliable. If you have a pitcher network out there and you have her two lieutenant, two lieutenant orders, you can be moving forward and spotlighting and moving forward and spotlighting and just, just getting missile plays off, getting oblivions off, getting carbonites off. Now, because she is very expensive and because she's very valuable, we need to play her accordingly. She is my favorite lieutenant in OSS. She's awesome. She's a do everything piece. There's always something she can do in any given turn. You need to keep her safe. Because she has a hacking device plus, she has access to the CyberMask program, and you should be using it. If in doubt, just end every turn, except for your very last turn, obviously, end every turn in CyberMask. If you are going second, almost always have her as your reserve drop. Yeah, the comp other competition, obviously, is posthumans, because you, when, when you reserve a posthuman, you reserve every posthuman body. But most of the time, where the posthumans are going will be kind of obvious the engineer will be hanging out with the link, etc. It is important enough to keep your Asura alive, particularly if you're saving points here and there by not taking chain of command, for example. It's important enough to keep your Asura alive that it's just worth having her be your reserve drop and having distance protector on the first turn. But even with 
all of those countermeasures, because she's hackable, she's a heavy infantry and a hacker, that first turn before you get a chance to cyber mask can be a little bit of an ass clencher. Yes, she can be repaired by an engineer, but you don't want to lose the lieutenant orders. You don't want her to stop being your lieutenant, even if you're taking a chain of command. Just do everything that you can or need to to keep her safe and intact through your first turn. Get her safely into Cyber Mask at the end of your first turn, and otherwise just kind of go nuts with her. Don't usually Rambo her, particularly on the first turn. That's not the kind of thing that she should be used for. There are circumstances, right? Like if you find yourself in an Ariadna matchup, for example, MSV3 can be really good to just clear out their midfield. But she is more expensive than many tags, and you want to budget your orders on her accordingly. Allocate orders to making sure that she is kept safe at the end of each turn, and if you do that, she will absolutely pay dividends. Now, while we're talking about lieutenants, we will go through the other good candidates, and that leads us on to the Shukra Consultant. Now, when the Shukra Consultant came out, he was basically lauded as the best lieutenant in the game. We have moved on since then, and for my money, I actually do not take Shukra Consultants in my OSS lists, rarely slash ever. However, that is because I like to live dangerously, and you might not be that kind of person. So, on their merits, what do we get out of a Shukra? Well, the first thing we get is Chain of Command profiles, usually just the 24-point version. Chain of Command, if we are taking an active lieutenant like the Asura or, for example, the Marut, is something that you may decide you just want to have in a list. That will be a question of your own personal appetite for risk. Do you think it is worthwhile spending 24 points in order to ensure against the risks of your Marut or Asura being isolated on the first turn? If the answer to that question is yes, and it absolutely can be, sensible in many cases, then the Shukra at least is 24 points for counterintelligence, which is really nice. Otherwise, what the Shukra has is a little bit of a bloated profile. Discover plus three and a biometric visor is like, okay, sure, I am not using this guy to hunt for days and speculo killers. He is too important. Like, if I round the corner against a Hassassin for day and go, ah ha ha, I'll have you know I have a biometric visor and a Discover plus three, and the Fide shotguns me uh, with its template, I will be, I will be sad. Uh, I will. That's not the outcome that I wanted. The Fide is worth, in many cases, less than the Shukra. Now, that's something that will probably change in N5, because we broadly understand shotguns to be changing. In particular, the direct template mode of shotguns seems to be going away, which makes this kind of a play actually much more viable than it used to be, and will enable Shukra consultants to fulfill their kind of intended role as Fide or Speculo Hunters much more easily. But at least in the last remaining month and a bit of Infinity and 4, don't use Shukras as impersonation hunters. They are, if you take Chain of Command, Counterintelligence Chain of Command, and if you take the Lieutenant profile, you get a relatively pleasantly costed Strategos Counterintelligence Lieutenant. And Strategos Level 1, Will Power 14, and Counterintelligence, all on a single model, is pretty nice. Now, ultimately... It's a very, very passive piece, and the Shukra Consultant, if you take the Strategos version, is also probably your most vulnerable lieutenant. Yes, the Marut and the Asura are hackable, and the Shukra is not, but the Shukra is a single wound dude. And if you've taken a Shukra as a lieutenant, and you are also considering taking a Shukra chain of command as a fallback position, we start at that point having the discussion about maybe just taking a more active, durable, and powerful lieutenant in any case. Nevertheless, if what you have as a list concept is a big idea that occupies a lot of points and you just can't stump up for the more expensive deluxe LT profiles, then a Shukra consultant is basically where it's at, and you can do a lot worse. There are plenty of factions that would really love to have a piece like this, and it says something to how powerful the active turn lieutenants are in OSS that I personally steer away from the Shukra lieutenant despite its availability. Now, bouncing from the active Asura to the inactive Shukra, all the way up to the maximally active lieutenant of the Marut, we have the Marut. Now, the Marut in ISS is something of a sometimes food, and that is mostly in comparison to vanilla Aleph. The ability to support the Marut is very slightly more limited. Firstly, especially if we take the Strategos Lieutenant Marut, and it is pretty attractive to do so, the Strategos 2 Lieutenant Marut is 2 SWC, which is very expensive. It's also a whopping 99 points, 
and we don't have any smoke in this faction to throw smoke and allow it to smoke to shoot through. Now, smoke shooting in N4 is less significant and powerful than it was in N3, but it's still a really nice tool to have, and we don't have access to it here. But for all that, this is still an absolutely premier tag. We have just the full tag package, including the very pleasing BTS-9 rather than the typical BTS-6. We have remote presence, fantastic, eat your hearts out, combined army, non-remote presence avatar. And the only MSV, I think, period on a tag, and absolutely the only MSV-2 on a tag, which makes the Marut the biggest MSV-2 gunfighting platform in the game. And there are certain situations where that just cracks a game open. The Marut can be a very, very powerful choice as your lieutenant slash big active piece in your second of two lists, because if you build like your first list to maximize the amount of hacking flex that you've got, and you just want a second list that is not trying to play the hacking game as much in case you run into Ariadna or Toha, the Marut is very, very good there. And in terms of pieces that will just blitz their way through, like Toha AROs, for example, you can't ask much more, aren't ask much more than the Marut. Ultimately, the platform is not complicated, but it's Ballistic Skill 15, which is the best in the game, Ballistic Skill Attack plus one damage, MSV2, Armor 8, BTS 9, 3 Structure, and Remote Presence. It's outstanding. Regardless of which profile you take, I personally lean toward the Strategios, mostly because if I lose the Marut, I've probably lost the game anyway, so I may as well double down and get the most out of it that I can. Because if you don't take the if you take the Marut as your lieutenant, so if you don't take the Marut as your lieutenant, you still need to find a lieutenant, and the cheapest we're looking at is like a 24-point 24, 24 Shukra, and so I may as well save those points, use those troop slots, take the, the Marut lieutenant in any case. But regardless of which profile you take, you just have a very, very, very high quality and dangerous tag, which in the second list, in any two-list pairing, can provide really tremendous value and be a tremendous build around. We've already taken a Willpower 15 Engineer in every list that we ever build in OSS, and since we've done that, we may as well make use of a fantastic remote presence structure piece in the form of this big girl. Now, that's all of the really big and important stuff. Let's move on to the smaller, but also important stuff. We're going to move now through ways that we can support and expand and add versatility to our link teams and general game plan generally, and that starts with the Denavis. Now, the Denavis can join Dakini fire teams. She does break the purity of that fire team, so you will lose composition bonuses, which makes her much better suited to joining a Harice team than joining a core assuming the core is going to be five person, but you can very easily do something that's like a four person Dakini link team just for six cents. We use maybe a different firepower piece in that case. We'll get to those in a moment. We can add the Denavis there if we wanted to run two of them. That is very viable. But regardless, any hacking centric operation subsection list should usually, in addition to the Asura, include one or more Denavis. And as soon as I start saying one or more Denavis, then we start to see the picture that emerges in terms of just how powerful hacking in this faction can be. Because we don't just have the Asura, we have one or more Denavis, and we have the proxy Mark II, which means that we have three or four willpower 15 hackers in the list. That's insane. That's just like, that is so much hacking. It is so difficult to overcome that. It means that any trip through an ARO uh, pit, repeat, repeater or pitcher is going to guaranteed result in significant info war response. And this is where we get this real high technology feel emerging in Operation Subsection. Now, the Denavis is just a very, very lean hacking device plus. There is absolutely nothing special about the physical body. Its stats are unexceptional. It's only Ballistic Skill 11, which is a little bit of a downside, but it's a BTS-3 Willpower 15 hacking device plus profile with bur plus one burst oblivion, which is excellent. And it has a pitcher, and it's the pitchers that are really, really important here. Linked pitchers are good. Multiple burst, excellent. Denavis are, apart from manually moving repeaters or hackers forward, Denavis are your only source of repeater projection, network projection, in Operation Subsection, and they're very important as a result. Now, Ballistic Skill 11 is on the lower side for the you know, Ballistic Skill of your pitches, particularly given that she's not going to benefit from link bonuses to her Ballistic Skill much slash at all. 
but we are almost always going to be taking baggage in Operation Subsection because of how useful Evo hackers are. And because Evo hackers are very useful and we always have baggage, you can start basically brute forcing pitches into play by just firing, reloading, firing, and reloading, and you can get tremendous network projection as a result. It takes a little bit of thought in your deployment because obviously you do need to have the Denavis in zone of control of the Evo hacker when you go to reload, but provided you can arrange that, you have really just excellent clean network projection from the Denavis just throwing out pictures as and where you need. And it kind of says something like, only in operation subsection would a Willpower 15 hacking device plus with an upgrade be primarily useful for the fact that she is network projection rather than an exceptional hacker in her own right. But that kind of is the case. A lot of the time, unless you're specifically going for that oblivion, the Denavis will mostly be making hacking AROs and extending your network because you'll have other hackers, especially the Asura, that might be doing the heavier lifting. For that reason, it's often going to be worth building your lists in a way that split the Denavis and the Asura across groups, especially if you only have one Denavis, just to maximize the potential to put that hacking power out of your groups if that's what it is you need. Overall though, genuinely exceptional piece. They are AVA3, don't take three of them, but one or two is going to be correct in basically any OSS list, but certainly any list that's trying to do info war. From the Denavis, we do naturally then have to talk about the probots, and really there is just one profile here we are interested in, which is the Evo hacker. I'm not going to dwell on this at length, but obvious, like for obvious reasons I've mentioned considerably already, the support wear from Probots has just multiple useful applications in Operation Subsection. You will have an absolute sure feat of good targets, good remotes that are targets for your support wear. Typically marksmanship, you can give enhanced reaction on like a Dakini Sniper if you want to go do Burst 3 in ARO because it stacks with Link Team bonuses. But generally, genu generally, you'll be handing out marksmanship for active turn firepower to get things like your multi-sniper or your HMG up to those truly lofty heights of you know good ballistic skill firepower bonuses, etc. And since we've gone and taken a probot, fantastic, we have baggage, which means that we can reload all of our pitches, etc. Very, very good piece. Really probably take it in most lists because, again, we are taking Takinis in most lists. Takinis really want support wear the OSS tends to just flow together in this way and a probot is part of that puzzle. Now, as an alternative to a probot, which I don't necessarily recommend, but is something to consider, we have the Aspara Cyber Dancers. Now, when these ladies were released, they were the only REM drivers in the game. Since then, REM drivers have been added to Infinity. There are a variety of REM drivers accessible to many factions, but the Aspara is the original and in many respects still the best. The Dakini that she chooses to inhabit at the beginning of the game gets Ballistic Skill 13, Willpower 14, and CC 15, and it's really that Ballistic Skill 13 that we care about. The advantage of the Aspara over an Evo Hacker is that she is active from the very beginning of the game, which means that if you need that Ballistic Skill bonus, she's there giving it to you from your first turn. No setup is required. Now, for my money, 22 points is still an awful lot of points to pay just for plus two blessing skill on one Dakini. And for that reason, I am not super inclined to take her unless I have a very specific game plan in mind that really does rely on going second a lot of the time. Despite that, as a concept, she is very cool. She can work quite well. And she's also a very cheap killer hacker if you want to investigate the alternate profile. 19 points for a KHD that does nothing than be a WIP14, BTS3 KHD that is there to make redundant use of your hacking networks just in case you either aren't taking an Asura or the Asura goes down is actually totally serviceable. And especially if you're doing something like running a Marut list, for example, but you still have Denavis, you're still doing hacking things, and a spy Aspara's killer hacker can be very, very relevant to your list's plan and very worth taking because, as we mentioned, OSS is vulnerable to enemy hacking networks, and so you need a plan to neutralize those hacking networks, and one of the best plans for neutralizing hacking networks is to kill all of the enemy hackers. And since we have good repeater projection with our pitches on our Denavis, taking just a Denavis, taking an Asparis KHD, if we aren't taking the uber hacker Asura, is a very good choice. 
Now, from here, we're going to start jumping into some ways that you can choose to spice up your Dakini link teams in addition to the Denavis. And I'm aware we are jumping all over the place a little bit here. OSS functions kind of a bit differently. And that starts with the rickshaw, kind of just awesome upgraded attack bot. Now, a rickshaw is in many respects kind of superior to a Dakini. It's got higher native ballistic skill, it has access to a heavy rocket launcher, which is a template weapon, it still has mimetism minus three and remote presence, but it has a lot more armor, armor three compared to armor zero on a Dakini. And of course it has that remote presence. And with remote presence and armor three, it's very difficult to put a rickshaw all the way to dead in a single order, just because of, especially because it's got total immunity. So you need to physically just punch all of those wounds into it. Sorry, I tell a lie, doesn't have total immunity. That's something else we'll be talking about. But sorry, armor, th armor three with remote presence is just very difficult to punch through. And the heavy rocket launcher is attractively costed. Now the downside of the rickshaw is that it breaks composition bonuses in a Dakini team. And so even though the HRL light shotgun especially can be a very attractive profile, and even the Red Fury is a high burst gun if you need it, and it's got more native ballistic skill than the Dakini, and it's got more armor, really whether or not you take a rickshaw is down to whether the list that you are building and the fire teams you're building care about composition bonuses or not. When this thing was first released, my initial appraisal was uh, maybe in a Harris team, I guess, if I have the SWC, but I have come around to the idea that you might actually choose to run a mixed four-person core and a mixed three-person Harris that make use of pieces like the rickshaw. Just because of the power of a template weapon, the fact that it's got a light shotgun gives it a little bit of close assault options. It is just a rounded piece compared to the Dakini pieces where like Dakini, multi-snipers and heavy machine guns, basically they do one thing. Yes, they do it very well. Yes, they do it very efficiently, but there is little in the way of versatility there. Whereas a rickshaw having more armor and a bit more ballistic skill, albeit obviously not getting link bonuses, just adds a bit more of a rounded option, albeit at a compromise. I still don't personally add them too often to OSS lists, but they do offer a very interesting way to change how a Dakini team works, and I would reach toward a rickshaw if I was choosing to, running, choosing to run in particular a mixed four-person team. Next up, we have the Dawan Tackbot, and this is where I was getting total immunity from, I do apologize. The Dawan Tackbot, another Tackbot that has arrived with the reinforcement pack, is the first Tackbot that actually is kind of just intentionally a close assault piece. Now, you can run these pieces as unlinked pieces, and they're certainly viable to do that. There are actually some slightly more attractive profiles. You only get access to the plus one burst chain rifle and pulsars on the non-FDO pieces, but a lot of the time you'll also be putting like one of these in a three-person Dakini team, and a very efficient three-person Dakini team consists of something like a Dakini gun, a Dawan Takbot, and like a Denavis, for example. And they are genuinely very solid close assault pieces. So what, what is the package we've got here? Most of the time what we're looking at are the, the cheaper template options, probably not the boarding shotgun. We are interested in the chain rifle and flam and spear, multi-pistol plus one burst profiles. Now, the Flam and Spear is surprisingly useful as an aero and even sometimes active turn option. I have absolutely gotten cheeky template kills in the past with a Flam and Spear just getting a splash onto something. Having that option is excellent. Being able to use it as an aero piece of desperation is excellent. But mostly we're looking to close with link bonuses and fork either a plus one burst chain rifle or pulsar and a burst four multi-pistol. Although the Dawan attack bots lack mimetism, they absolutely have dogged and total immunity, which means they are able to really keep pushing and potentially kill. They dodge very well, and if they do get into close combat, they will make use usually of those plus one burst multi-pistols. So they'll be firing burst two double action rounds in close combat with CC22 and martial arts. They won't necessarily beat the truly high watermark, like high martial arts, natural born warrior kind of pieces, although that's something that could change in N5. We know that natural born warrior in particular is changing, but that is good enough close combat, burst two 25s, thanks to martial arts, to punch through kind of any non-CC expert, which is something that is genuinely rare and doesn't, didn't previously exist in any capacity in Operation Subsection. So just for being a powerful close combat piece that is linkable, the Dawan attack bots are excellent. 
And the combination of Dogged and Total Immunity really lets you push some powerful offensive options with them, or use them as defensive pieces if you need to. Now, if you are using them defensively, just as a I need a template to defend on the first turn, bear in mind that Dogged is optional. And depending on what's attacking you, you don't get you don't have to decide whether or not to trigger Dogged until after everything has been resolved. You know how much damage you've done to your opponent. So you will usually only choose to trigger Dogged if it's necessary to do so to stop an offense from continuing. If you knock an enemy unconscious, but you also take a wound, it can be very valuable to just choose to go unconscious because you have an engineer that's willpower 15 that can probably recover the down one. So make that choice. Remember that no wound incapacitation, so or Dogged in this case, interacts with remote presence. So a down one attack bot has to take two orders to go Dogged because you would enter unconscious one and unconscious two in the same order, trigger Dogged, but once you trigger Dogged, any further wounds will kill you. Very useful piece, attractively costed, difficult to fit just because so much of OSS is kind of already very, very good, but an excellent addition to the faction. Now, on the cheaper end of ways to customize a Dakini link is we have the CSU Corporate Security Unit. Now, CSUs will break Dakini Purity Bonuses, so again, typically they are only going to be taken either in a mixed four-person link that you're making four-person just for six cents, or in a three-person Harry's team moving up the field. And although a um, Denavis would be the more common go-to specialist, if you just need a cheaper option, the CSU is kind of there and, and is cheaper. In N4, generally the most comfortable choice is going to be the Rifle Light Shotgun Specialist Operative, which coming in at 11 points is cheaper even than the cheapest Dakinis, and is just a generally well-rounded, useful addition to a smaller fire team. It has a rifle, it's ballistic skill 12, it has a template weapon, and it's a specialist, admittedly a very low willpower one. But something to consider as we move into N5 is that you might instead, even looking for a cheap one, you might choose to do something like take the Combi Rifle Nanopulsor Plus One Burst, or even potentially the Breaker Rifle Nanopulsor Plus One Burst. In fact, often the Breaker Rifle Nanopulsor Plus One Burst, uh, Breaker being a very useful ammunition type. Those two profiles are still just 12 points, and Nanopulsors remain good direct template weapons in Infinity and 5, whereas shotguns, of course, might potentially be changing to be still good as close assault pieces, plus 6 in a good range band is excellent, but not direct template weapons. So CSUs are a very useful, just like cheap addition to a link team that adds some utility, admittedly at the cost of breaking composition bonuses, and you will often find CSUs used just to bulk out forces where needed. Now, that kind of overlooks the other thing that they have going for them that is a little subtle, but is very important to note, which is that they are one of the very, very few unhackable pieces that we have kind of just talked about so far, period. Because they are just a human, yes, you can't use your engineer to recover them. That's obviously a little bit of a downside. But if you need to go through a hacking network and you have no choice but to risk hacking AROs to progress, something has to go in and kill a repeater, for example, your opponent has fired at your deployment zone, the CSU are kind of that. And that alone can be, if not a sole reason to include them, then absolutely something that you need to remember when you do take them, because that can be admittedly niche, but when it comes up, it's just very, very valuable to have. Just an unhackable piece that, yes, it will get spotlight, that's fine, but just to go in and kill repeaters so that the keys can then freely move. Now, from CSUs, we use, we move to motorized bounty hunters, which are alongside the Dawon, basically the other side of close assault, particularly quick, dangerous close assault, that Operation Subsection can take. And they are just very, very solid in Operation Subsection. As bikers, they are fast. 8.6 is excellent. They've got booty reroll, which can produce some really good results. Sometimes it does nothing, but often it's very, very good, particularly with the reroll. Membertism 3, good ballistic skill. And especially that submachine gun profile is just a great close assault piece that is only going to get proportionally better in Infinity and 5. Nine points is excellent, and a submachine gun and plus one burst chain colt gives you both a template weapon and a dangerous short range gun. Now, looking forward to N5, we do know 
probably from the quick start rules that submachine guns are probably just going to be shock ammunition high burst guns, which means we are probably losing the armor piercing rounds as an option, which does very lightly diminish the offensive power of the MBH as a close assault piece, but only very lightly. And by comparison, retaining both the mimetism, ballistic skill 12, etc., with the plus one burst chain call, a true close assault template weapon, which shotguns will cease to be, is very valuable. Now, as a quick, very strictly speculative note, we know that vehicles are being introduced in Infinity N5, and a motorcycle is a vehicle, so it is possible that we will see further changes to how motorcycles work in Infinity N5 that could just further change the role of something like an MBH. Really no way of knowing that for sure at this stage. That is strictly speculative. I am purely going on the fact that by its very definition, a motorcycle is a vehicle, and the vehicle rules will probably plug quite well into what motorcycles do. That, however, is strictly speculative. In N4, one or more motorized bounty hunters make a great, unhackable, cheap assault piece. They are one of the very few irregulars you would routinely or can even access in OSS, and for that reason, a fantastic supplement to any OSS force if you can just find the troop slot for them. Now, from here, as I usually do, we're going to just do a very quick run through some profiles that are not auto-includes, but which you might want to try because they are cool and fun. And I'm going to start with Dart Optimate, Hunt Optimate Huntress. Now, Dart is expensive, and it can be difficult to include a piece as expensive as she is in a faction like OSS, but she has a suite of tools that is very cool. She fits the aesthetic of the faction exceptionally well, and she, alongside Nagas, start opening up kind of a midfield play that is just fun to have as a list archetype. We are already going to be taking a Posthuman Mark II. If we add in Dart and even, say, a Naga Mine Layer, we now have four Camouflage Markers in the midfield, one of which, yes, is obviously going to be a Posthuman because it's Mimitism 6, but the others will all be Mimitism 3, and kind of just, you know, pleasantly obfuscate what it is that's going on and present a slightly different threat. Dart, I think, also plugs well into a, okay, I don't need hacking as much in this list, uh, because this is to play against Ariadna, for example, and Dart is very solid as an anti-Ariadna at all. She's MSV1 and Mimetism, which just makes her very good at fighting Ariadne and Mimetism pieces, and the rest of what she does is just kind of good and cool. She can go after enemy pieces on rooftops, ferret them out, kill them. She's an excellent Moran hunter. Not necessarily easy for her to do that, but if you manage to use her in that way, she can be very, very good at it. The only thing really holding her back is her cost, and if you can just find a way to afford her, maybe alongside, say, a Naga Mine Layer, she can be a really cool piece to add to a list. Next up, on the pieces you might be interested in trying, we have the Rudris Gunbot. Usually either the K1 Marksman Rifle or the Red Fury plus one damage. Uh, the K1 Marksman Rifle if you have no SWC spare, and the Red Fury plus one damage if you do. We are mostly taking this guy, but firstly just because he's a big, chunky, climbing plus boy, which is fun to use, but also because he's a mind dispenser. I mentioned that we almost always take baggage in Operation Subsection because of how good the Evo Hacker is with all of our stuff, including, for example, the Rudris Gunbot. And since we've got baggage, taking a mind dispenser can just be a really fun flex. Now, 38 points for the very cheapest profile that we might consider taking here is still an expensive spend. It is not easy to add one of these to any given list. They are hard to add in, but if you can include them, you get a proper two-structure armor 4 BTS piece. It's ballistic skill 12, but can be given marksmanship. It has remote presence, so it has all of the usual benefits in combination with your engineer. It is a repeater, which actually is quite meaningful in some lists, but mostly, again, I am endorsing this thing because the mind dispenser go brr is, is fun. It's just fun to have that in a list, and since we've already taken an Evo hacker, we don't need to do anything other than add the gun bot, in order to get all of that benefit. Even in the best case scenarios, it's a little bit of a sometimes play, but it's a very fun sometimes play and worth experimenting with. Finally, I want to sort of mention Maximus. Now, Maximus, the more I see him and the more I play against him, is actually just kind of a solid piece on his own merits. Uh, he is points expensive, not cripplingly, but, you know, you get kind of what you pay for, but he is ultimately very cheap in terms of SWC, whether you have him as your lieutenant or not, and that's especially valuable in a faction like Operation Subsection. If we are running a hacking platform and we're running guided missiles and we've put something like a 1.5 SWC Dakini gun in a link, we start to just run out of SWC very, very quickly, and having access to a half SWC Ballistic Skill 14 tag level firepower piece 
even if it is only fighting in marksmanship, multi-marksman rifle range bands, is still kind of solid. Now, yes, we pay a points premium, ultimately, for what is otherwise a burst 4 ballistic skill 14 gun with reasonably good stats. 71 points is a lot because we're paying for critical immunity, possession immunity, etc. Uh, CC24, natural born warrior, like all of that stuff. Maximus has a lot going on, and he is, despite being possession immune, absolutely not an unhackable close assault pace. But he is effectively four wounds because the pilot Maximus is very capable of continuing a fight by himself, particularly in close combat. And just having access to that very low SWC cost, quite solid gun, either as a lieutenant or otherwise, opens up interesting build options in Operation Subsection. The points cost is very high. No way to get around that. 71 points is a large proportion of your list. But if you can find a way to get those points in, you open up interesting options from an SWC perspective. Now, rounding this faction focus out, we're just going to very quickly jump into a sample list. And big thanks again to Zephyr who provided this list. This is one of theirs, not one of mine, but I like this one a lot. We are starting with an Asura Lieutenant plus one order, hacker, hacking device plus upgrade, Trinity, huh, kitchen sink profile, excellent, 69 points, nice. Uh, we then have a couple, in this case, of smaller fire teams. There are a few ways that you can structure these because we are not going for pure composition bonuses, but I suspect, didn't ask them about this, probably should have, we first have a Harice team with a Dakini heavy machine gun, a Danavas hacking, hacking device plus pitcher, and then a close assault Dawon, and then a five-person impure core rickshaw-based team, which we have a rickshaw heavy rocket launcher, Danavas, Dawon, CSU, and Dakini. The Dakini is important because if it dies, you can't really form the link anymore. But otherwise, what we have here is a team that is more willing to be expendable. Losing models out of this, even though it's a five-person team, losing models is much less important. The CSU, for example, or the Dawon, are much more usable as ablative elements. We can more happily go dogged with the Dawon in the knowledge that we aren't giving up as much because we're using the higher base stats of the rickshaw to compensate. We then just have one of a couple of flashbots. Yep, flashbots are very, very good. We move into combat group two, which is where we put our proxies. We have the engineer Yudbot with Yudbot. Yep, totally standard. Uh, in this instance, we've got a Mark V forward observer. Now, I do note here, this is a flex that Zephyr has made just to free up some points. They have intentionally chosen not to take the 25-point hacking device plus. Now, that is not normally something that I would recommend because that profile is just absolutely on cocaine, but so is the engineer and so is the forward observer. And sometimes you just have to find yourself cutting some SWC and some points. And we've gotten quite a lot, particularly into our first combat group, by making that change. So credit to Zephyr for doing a little bit of innovation there. I think that's very interesting. I think that's very solid. And it has given us a list that is freed itself from some of the shackles of what I would have considered to be auto-includes without really giving up much functionality. And if we stop and think about it, this list is not struggling for hacking devices. <laughs> There are two Denavis and an Asura in this list. We can probably quite reasonably say we didn't also need the posthuman. So fair enough, interesting innovation. I really like that. And we still have the Mark V forward observer, which is excellent, and the Mark I engineer, which is excellent. We then have our missile launcher, our Evo hacker, another flash pulse bot, and a single motorized bounty hunter just to give us some excellent group two fast close assault, giving us overall a list that is pretty well positioned to basically do any scenario if it needs to. With the sole exception of biotech for all, where you need to configure your lists a little bit differently just to make sure everything gets out of the biotech zones, this is just a really solid, really well-rounded list that can play into just about any scenario off the back of good hacking, good defense, good offense, good force reconstitution, and high willpower specialists. It's an excellent list, and it also represents some of the evolutions that OSS has gone through from its origins in M3 into N4. And that wraps up this OSS faction focus. Uh, as I've said previously, we do intend to keep doing some faction focuses over the remainder of this edition, but they will continue to be looking forward to N5 with an eye toward either how the faction might change or just how changes that we know are happening in N5 could affect it. If you enjoyed this, as a reminder, you can support the channel via the Buy Me A Coffee link in the video description below or by becoming a channel member. Big thanks to everyone that has so far.
at this stage, I am still planning on having the next video be uh, how to survive Infinity N5 and addition changes in your favorite war game. I have that one mostly written up, but it needed a little bit more time to cook because it is talking about some relatively sens sensitive things, including just emotional responses to a new addition. I do look forward to doing it, but I need to be in the right mindset to have that conversation, and I need to make sure that everything is done and it's scripted in a way that just kind of makes sense. As always, I hope very much that you enjoyed this. I'm not exactly sure what the next video will be, but maybe it will be that one or something else. And regardless, I will see you next time.